So most of us here have had loved ones and friends who have been touched by cancer over the years. Uh, we've known what their journey has been. Unfortunately, in India, many, many people who are touched by cancer do not have the financial resources to either start their treatment or to complete it, so they leave it midway. Uh, early in the 1990s, uh, Dr. Kopikar, uh, Pune's leading oncosurgeon, realized that patients came to him and they needed help and they were very poor and they were unaffording. And all he could do as a cancer surgeon was just operate them free. Could not pay for hospital charges, chemotherapy, radiation or anything further. So he, along with some cancer patients, survivors and like-minded people, got together to take care of these cancer patients by starting a foundation. Because many of these patients could be completely cured and have a normal life if they had funds available. There was no money at that time, and uh, they went to schools and colleges like y'all to collect newspapers from students and sell them to be able to fund a few patients. Today, 25 years later, the foundation is a fledging organization, and we touch thousands of lives every day through free ships. So to begin my story, thank you. To begin my story, I'd like to share, uh, every time a patient comes in, there are a few patients that stay with you all your life. And they make you proud and they change you more than you change them. I want to talk about one particular patient who came with a cancer. His name is Shivanand. And he came to us many years ago and he uh, was an orphan. His mother was a housemaid and uh, he got cancer and he needed the treatment. If he got the treatment, he would definitely be cured. And uh, he was giving his 10th standard exam. It so happened that the protocol of his chemotherapy coincided with his exam days. So we all counseled him and said, it's not a problem, give your exam next year. And he would smile and we said, you know, your paper's at two in the afternoon. How will you go taking chemo in the morning? He kept smiling and we opened the chemo daycare at eight in the morning that he finishes the chemo. All the clinic staff and other patients got together. They kept dry fruits for him. Somebody bought him breakfast. Somebody bought him lunch. And I'd phone him every morning before coming to work. It was summer. And I would ask him, what do you want? And just like me, every morning he'd say, mangoes, mangoes, mangoes. So I'd make a mango milkshake and I'd cut mangoes and bring it for him. One hand was the chemo drip going on. On the other hand, on his lap was his book. And he'd be studying. And he would leave our daycare around 1 o'clock. We'd all hug him and tell him all the best. And he would go to give his paper. His chemo finished in a couple of weeks and his exams were over and we forgot about it for the moment and we were busy with other patients. One day in the clinic, in the morning, I was not even looking towards the entrance, someone came and hugged my feet. It's a custom in India to give respect to somebody, the younger ones come and you know, touch your feet. I picked him up and he had a box of mitai. And I said to him, oh my God, you've passed, you've passed. We all thought, you know, not to worry about it. And uh, I said, well, how did you do? And he showed me his mark sheet. And I looked at it, I couldn't make out anything for the moment. And he said to me, I came first in Maharashtra. I said, wow, he said, I came first in Maharashtra. So this is one great example of, of the patients that we take care of who do not have the financial need, but they can be fully, fully cured. He changed me. Today, I'm proud to say I spoke to him a few days ago, and he's becoming a chartered accountant in six months. His mother still does domestic chores in a family home in Aund, and uh, he's gone on to become a CA. So I'm looking forward to helping him later and getting him into some institute where he could get a good job. So my journey now is all about the foundation and what we do and how we join the dots in India to give quality of life to cancer patients, whether affording or not affording. Cancer is growing exponentially in India and it's increasing. We are seeing breast cancer in India at an average age of 44 against the Western world of 60 years old. I'll bet every single day I see girls in the clinic in their early 30s and early 40s, so it's getting much younger. There's a high rate of mortality and morbidity with breast cancers in India, and 1,64,000 new cases are being registered annually in India, making it the largest cancer in the country. Unfortunately, one out of Two of these patients succumb to it because they do not come early and are, there is a lack of awareness. The main reason for this mortality is a lack of awareness. An Indian woman doesn't know early signs of breast cancer, what are treatment protocols, or what are the risk factors. An Indian woman does not even know there are five stages of breast cancer. Stage zero is when the lump comes up and it's a precancerous stage. And it takes approximately a window period of eight years or more. Can you imagine eight years or more to become stage one of cancer? If picked up at that time, it's easily curable.
The second myth Indian women have is you have a cancer, remove the breast, the cancer is gone. Absolutely not. So the doctors are mastectomizing the woman, removing her breasts, leaving her mutilated without a breast, left, right and center. The woman is not empowered to know the gold standard of treatment all around the world is breast saving surgeries or restoring the breast, not mutilating her, leaving her without a breast. It create, creates a low self-image, the body image. It also affects your survivorship. Because the woman is not empowered and she doesn't know that this option is available, she doesn't demand it from her doctor. And the doctors in our country very often are not trained and they don't keep up with the standard to be able to offer it to, her, to the patient. In the 1990s, there were hardly 12 cancer institutes in India. Three decades later, that's 30 years later today, we have 300 cancer hospitals. Can you imagine? But the question lies, do any of these hospitals give affordable, treatment of excellence to every patient, irrespective of her social, economic, and financial background? Or is the treatment just mediocre, making the girl run helter to skelter from doctor to doctor for multiple opinions, each, multi each opinion contradicting the earlier one, confusing her further, and also delaying her timely treatment? So the idea was born to us that we need to put out a center of affordable excellence, which is equal to all whoever walks in. At the same time, the center should be holistic. It should handhold a patient through the bilbeting maze of challenges this disease brings to its wake and preparing her for a normal life after the disease. So how do we start? What do we do? So we realize the most important part is awareness to create awareness among the community at large. We went about having massive marathons in Pune, where over 20,000 people would come together. In those marathons, we would educate them about risks of breast cancer, early breast cancer, give them literature and pamphlets. We also made sure that we got a Bollywood celebrity, because after all, we live in India. If we don't have a celebrity or we do not have a cricketer, it doesn't really work too well. We had print media, we had digital media programs, we also had breast symposiums every year, and we had a bus. We had three buses fully equipped with mammogram, uh, colposcopy, biopsies. It went to every slum in Pune. I'm proud to say we sent it right up to Ratnagiri. We sent it to Bombay. We sent it to all the fringe areas. Thousands of women were screened, thousands. And so many were brought to the clinic with breast cancer early, and they are alive today because of the screening program. We had breast symposiums all over the city, which was complimentary, where we educated and doctors came, there were panel discussions, and we educated women on breast cancer, how to pick up early cancers, and how to um, identify an early cancer. Through these programs, we let her know that it's very important, the risk factors to maintain a healthy lifetime, to have early children, to breastfeed. We even taught her how to do a self-breast um, um, self examination. Most women did not know. Since you're not a doctor or a nurse, you cannot do a self-breast examination on dry skin. For a woman who's menstruating, it has to be a few days after her periods. We taught her that in her shower, she has to soap herself, use the right hand for the left breast, and go under the arm clockwise and anti-clockwise, and likewise for the next breast, to look out for some discharge from the nipple, whether it's clear water or blood. If it's either of them, it's a very early cancer. She should go and talk to a doctor. We asked her to look out for a rash or a hardening of the skin which does not heal. We asked her to look if her nipple was introverted. They were all very, very early stages of breast cancer, which could easily be cured, and the women were not aware. We also educated her that mammograms are very important after the age of 40, and she must go to a, a proper center and have herself checked up annually. We also taught her the gold standard of treatment, where breast cancer can be totally cured, and also that her breast should not be removed, she should not be mastectomized, and she should have a breast restored. So this is what we educated them with. What happens after that? There were still very, very big gaps in the whole treatment and protocol of cancer. So we decided that a center of affordable excellence should be put up, and it should be put up in Pune to showcase to the world and to our country that it's very, very easily doable if you have passion and if you have focus. So in a very, very limited space of a couple of thousand square feet, with no funds at all, I used to call myself for many years, it's my 12th year now in the foundation, I used to call myself for many years the beggar, because I used to go to the community to beg for donations and community fund. But no one turned us back, and I must say we have a great um, you know, backbone in Pune, uh, with the people who have a heart to give, and uh, we set up the center with paramedical and medical experienced staff that manned it. It had the state-of-the-art diagnosis, which was unmatched in the city. It had a 
3D tomosynthesis, which picks up early cancers, and automated breast ultrasound, which is known as a poor man's MRI to pick up early cancers in young girls. It had a biopsy uh, precision machines, which was very rare in India. And of course, a VAB biopsy machine. When a woman has a fibroid or cyst, we see she's admitted in a hospital, she's mutilated, she's cut up, there are stitches on her breast to just remove a fibroid or cyst. This machine removes it in a couple of minutes. It's stitchless, it's scarless, and it's painless. And she can go home in about half an hour and lead a normal life. Then we realized, what about the holistic part? So the holistic part included yoga, nutritionists, counselors, genetic counseling to uh, 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 address the risk of hereditary cancer and to see how to manage it. We then went on to have an oncopharmacy, a pharmacy which was very, very important that gave medicines free to all unaffording patients in our country. So from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, we couriered medicines to any cancer patient who came to us or wrote to us and needed drugs. Every single day, our boys would go and give home delivery free in Pune and around Pune to anyone who was poor and needed cancer drugs or any lady who did not have a caregiver or a family member who could come. And then. After that, we went on to put a 12-bedded daycare in our clinic, which has loungers. It had individualized TVs. Also, they had free uh, counselors and nutritionists who could help them through the, uh, through the procedure. And also, they did not have to go to a hospital to get admitted for chemotherapy. It took only four hours, just four hours. Normally, hospitalization is overnight, or it takes 10 to 12 hours, and was in a cozy environment. And finally, I realized more important than anything is support support and support. So we put out in 2009-2010 Pune's first Pink Ribbon Club. This Pink Ribbon Club is amazing because I personally believe that everyone is a friend, only we haven't been introduced. And this showed the power of that. Today I'm standing in an area called Vagoli in Pune, and if a patient from this area comes to us, and we have 40 or 50 patients already in this area, we introduce her to them. They come and embrace her like a family. Someone drives her for radiation, someone sits with her through chemo, someone sends food at night for her but she doesn't have to cook dinner, somebody else sits outside the hospital while she's being operated, and somebody takes her child on a Sunday for a picnic or for a movie. This is the power of a support group. Once this was over, we also realized that to bring down the rate of mastectomy in India, meaning leaving a woman mutilated without a breast, was very, very important. So what do we do? It was shown in 2015 that 80% of Indian women were being mastectomized against 25% only in the Western world. Her breast was not being restored. When a woman comes up with a diagnosis of cancer, can you imagine what she's going through? Psychologically, the trauma, and then on top of that to be told she's going to lose her breast. The breast has always been an organ of beauty, sensuality, sexuality. It enhances the woman's self-esteem and her body image. As she's getting older, the breast loses its firmness. It also starts to sag. On top of that, if she's going to lose her organ, you can imagine what that will do. So we set, aside, set, set on to start an oncoplastic training program or an oncoplastic unit to start with in Pune, where one surgeon, the cancer surgeon, he or she would reconstruct or restore the woman's breast at the same time. So she goes in for anesthesia, the cancer is removed, her breast is re restored or reconstructed, lifting the other breasts too. The incisions are either around the nipple in the areola, the delicate skin around the nipple, or under the breast, which heal in a couple of months, so the no scars are seen. She wakes up, she has better looking breasts than she went in before, her body image is in intact, her self-esteem is intact, and gives her better survivorship and a better quality of life. To adapt to the Indian situation, we made sure that we did not have a second surgeon, a plastic surgeon doing the job because the cost would double. So it was the same as the cancer surgeon. So the cost became much lesser. And also we innovated newer techniques so as to bring the cost lower for the Indian woman. How do we go about doing this in the whole country? How do we spread it? We need to train the surgeons. If they are not trained, they can't offer it to the woman. If the woman doesn't know about it, she can't demand it from her surgeon. So we set up five years ago an oncoplastic unit program in our country, first in India and Asia, which was akin and adopted from the UK one. In this program, it brought down the mastectomy rates. Over 500 surgeons today have been trained from all over Asia, from Indonesia, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Maldives, the Middle East, and many parts have come and got trained in how to restore a woman's breast. 
uh, today, uh, the, uh, the best part is more of many of them have also gone on to do the masters in the degree. Today, the outcome of this is all over India, mushrooming our oncoplastic units in breast centers. The mastectomy rates have gone down. The breast re reconstruction rates have gone up all over our country, and women are being left whole. Their body image is taken care of, their sensuality, the sexuality, and then survivorship. Many papers today, international and national papers and breast cues, have proved today that if a woman is not mutilated and she is restored again, it gives her better survivorship. So this was the other uh, vacuum that we filled into the pie. And then finally, we realized that it's very, very, very important that we have personalized treatment for the Indian woman. So just to let you know, many cancers in India are very aggressive, especially breast cancer, and 30% of these cancers in our country are called triple negative, TNBC. Their biological behavior and genetically, they behave very different from the Western uh, cancers. But unfortunately, the treatment is the same copy as the Western. The treatment protocol is the same. So there's a very, very big gap so we are just copying the treatment from there, but our cancers are totally different. They behave differently. So how do we realize where is the gap and what do we do? So we realize that it's very, very important to set up a consortium because the clinicians, the researchers, and the research units are not coinciding together and they don't talk. A doctor and a clinician does not tell a researcher or a research institute what is the problem for the patient so they can solve it. We have many research institutes in India, like abroad. There are very well known, like the Sloan Catering, MD Anderson, uh, you know, the UK University, the Cambridge University. All of them are headed by Indians. Many of them are spearheaded by Indians, and they are our backbone. But unfortunately, very little quality research comes out from India. We make up 17% of the world's brains, but only 2.5% or 2.8% of quality research comes out because of the gap between the clinician, the researcher, and the doctor. So to bridge this gap, we decided to put out a consortium and uh, between clinicians, biologists, and the researchers to solve problems like the triple negative for India. It's 30% in India, where it's only approximately one third of that in the, in the Western world. Why is it happening so much in India? What is the reason? So this consortium led to forming of CTCR, the Center of Transcendental Research, where clinicians, biologists, and researchers would come together and form answers for this. It then went on to become a member of the most prestigious government of, government of India, Genome India National uh, Project. Uh, and which maps the Indian genes, the healthy Indian genes. And two years ago, we also set up in India and established the ICGA, that's the Indian Genome Cancer Atlas, which will be mapping cancer genes of Indian people and establishing them. Now, we have tried however we can to complete the circle to give quality care to the patient. And finally, I also want to let you know before I end that how does this accumulate into good quality care for a patient? I would like to let you see one more patient of mine, Jayashri Nikam. Uh, she was born with polio, so she was handicapped. And she came to us. She's very, very unaffording. She came to us for free ship. We reconstructed her breast. We gave her chemo and radiation. And the first thing she told us is that I have one handicap. It's taken me years to deal with that handicap of polio and to get back to a normal life. I don't want my breast removed. I don't want to be handicapped. And she comes from a lower strata of society where she volunteers in a bal uh, Gandharva, like a crash in the slums and she was so empowered and she says do not mutilate me keep me well informed all these patients over the years have uh, changed me completely they have made me realize the power of gratitude the power of saying thank you to the almighty for every little thing that we have the power of love and uh, because of them uh, Two years ago, I wrote a book called Triumph Over Breast Cancer. It uh, was a story, a chronicle of 23 women on different walks of life who went through cancer and how they showed their strength. And uh, I've just finished writing my second book on genetic cancers for the common person. Hope to publish it next year after COVID. And uh, they have really changed my life. And today, we do what we do because of wonderful people like you from the community who give back to us either monetarily or the luxury of your time. In immense gratitude. Thank you.